Hello, everybody. Oh, I'm talking to you, listener. Yes, <laughs> you with the headphones on, listening to this podcast. You're like, God, these are so good. We're just enjoying it. You're like, what do they have in store for us today? Uh, today, we got a really, really uh, great guest. Corbin, let me ask you a question. Sure. What does the world need more of? Oh, definitely like puppies. I mean, have you ever seen a puppy? They're great. <laughs> no, cri crypto. We need more crypto. Oh, we need no, more crypto. It's not crypto. <laughs> we also need more puppies. No, it's neither of those things. You know what the world needs? More nice guys. Mm. It really does. And our guest today, uh, Mr. Charles Carpenter, he is one of the nicest guys in the business. He is just a lovely, lovely person. I've known him for many, many years, um, more because we kind of were in similar circles, but then I got to know him really well. Um, when we started an acting studio together, but he has worked, um, you know, uh, in casting as a teacher, as a mentor, as an actor, he's a father, he's a husband, you know, if you're interested in any of those things, which I know you are Corbin, a lot of those things, <laughs> um, then Charles is your guy. He, he works all the time. Everybody loves him. You're going to love him. Uh, let's welcome to the show. Mr. Charles Carpenter. Hello. Yay. Hey, thank you guys. Wow, he sounds really cool. What, 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 when you list it all out like that. This is do you want to meet Charles? Do you want to meet this? Do you want to meet this guy? Can I, meet can I get his number? I'm just, no. uh, Charles is the guy that brings coffee to this other Charles every morning. Um, so well, thank you guys. You forgot sexy, but you know, oh yes, we'll work that in throughout. We'll, we'll put that in the description. <laughs> Yeah, Charles, he's just sexy. There's so sexy. <laughs> well, Charles, we are so excited to have you here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that, that that you're here. That you said yes. I want to dive right in, Charles. How do you, uh, you know, I'm, I listed a lot of things there. What, um, wh how do you define yourself, Charles, with this, with the stuff you've done? Gosh, you know what? Um, I always, it, it's funny. I always said at, growing up, I want to be able to provide for my family as an actor and entertainer. So, you know, I, I feel really, really grateful that I've been able to do that and been able to sustain that for a couple decades, you know? Um, so I, I proudly say I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a working actor. This is, and, and, and the thing is, I hope that everybody listening who wants to get in this space and work, can say that about themselves because I think that the, the thing that is really important that's vital that we understand is if you're waiting on somebody else to validate you, you're never going to get anywhere that you want to be. So you have to proclaim it. You have to declare it yourself that, yeah, I am a professional, consistently working actor because if you are about it, then you're going to be consistently working. You're going to get up in the morning. You're going to look at breakdowns. You're going to read copy. You're going to get together with people. That's the work. The thing that I find um, with all the youngins, all oh, you youngins out there nowadays. Uh, Charles, back, is Charles is 97. Charles is 97. Fast forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everybody, everybody's waiting on somebody else to let them know they're good or to let them know they're working mm -hmm. or, okay, I booked this, therefore I am right. No, it starts. That mindset has to begin with you because if you can't find the validation for yourself, if you can't find the fulfillment within yourself, trust me, man, it, it's an industry that can tear you up. So I want everybody to know if you believe it, we're going to, why would I believe that you're amazing if you don't, mm -hmm. you know? And so yeah, I am a I am a professional, consistently working actor, uh, artist. You know, I, I'm a writer as well. I've I've written three novels that I absolutely love. I'm working on the fourth. I I'm a storyteller, and that's the name of our you know our school. John and I uh, created, and, and Corbin that you're a part of, and I and I love so much. Storytellers Conservatory is an incubator for talented, brilliant people to come together and find a safe place to be and to grow and to explore. And like, I, I like the Judd Apatow school of thought mm -hmm. that, you know, he works with the same people, with the same crew, much like a, a Christopher Guest. He, they, they work with the people they want to work with and they do these different projects because like, this is my crew. This, these are, this, this is, this is my, this is my clan, right? This is my tribe. We're doing our stuff. And that's what I, I feel we've created with Storytellers Conservatory. There's this group of brilliant, beautiful, wonderful people who um, all aspire to those same lofty heights. And 
So it's, so when I say I'm an actor and my long tooth way of getting to the point, I am, mm-hmm. and, and I'm a working actor. And I think that everybody listening, so long as they allow themselves to believe that they are, don't wait for somebody else to tell you what you are. Mm. I love that. Yeah. You don't want to wait on gatekeepers. Right? Yeah. Why wait on the gatekeepers, you know, or the validation? I, I agree, Charles. It's like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta enjoy it for yourself. You gotta own it for yourself, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's great. I was just thinking about today, this idea of like being a dreamer. And I think sometimes dreamer can feel like you're not taking practical steps, but mm. I also feel like if you think of a lot of people that have created businesses or artists they're, they're, they're dreamers with ambition that also take the practical steps. And yeah. I think there's nothing wrong with, with being a dreamer, you know, that of this idea of like, you're saying of like where you wanted to go, like, that's like the dream, you know, you're trying to create this life where you're, you're sure. a professional actor. And I think that's, you know, what you've worked towards. Right. I, I love what you said about gatekeepers. It's totally it. Like you're waiting for the casting director or the producer or the director who, or, or, or whoever it is to say, yeah, you're good enough now. You're, you, you can, you can enter the hallowed halls. Right. But until you feel it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter if I, if, if you or I, or any of us tell somebody, yeah, you're a brilliant actor until they feel it in their hearts. It, it's not going to land. It doesn't mean anything. So yeah, absolutely. The gatekeeper is a great, uh, that's a, that's a great way to, to describe it. We don't, we have to, we have to take care of ourselves and, and shepherd and support what we want. Yeah, I, I think it's not even so much in a negative way. It's just like you're, nobody's going to look out for me more than me. And like you kind of yeah. have to be that person. And I know I have so many people that love and care about me, too. And I expect, you know, some support, but it's not going to be on them to make my dreams come true. And I think that's a really important note to have. And actually, uh, Charles, what you're I mean, I could just listen to you forever because you're so inspirational and you're like have that motivation. You're just you're just oh, so, you. so great in that kind of way. Did you have any? mentors or like people who kind of did the same thing for you and like what was that like when like how, where are you plucking that from because it's so great oh thanks you know what um honest okay this the, the first one's going to sound really corny and cheesy but my dad i love my dad god rest nice. his soul he's up there in heaven with champagne right now listening to us so <laughs> he, he 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 may not have clicked subscribe but he's listening <laughs> That's okay. yeah. um but he all he he always made me believe that I was more than just the sum of my parts because I'm on my dad's side. I am uh, I'm, I'm black and then either Scandinavian or Scottish from the slave owners uh, who, in the family. And then on my mom's side, I'm Spanish and Mexican Native American. So I'm a whole bunch of stuff, but I've never really fit into any one group. You know, like in my career, I've been told you're not tall enough, muscular enough, handsome enough, black enough, white enough. Latino enough. Like I've been told I'm not enough, mm. enough. I'm, I'm, I'm done hearing it. Right. For sure. Um, but he always made me feel like it's okay. Embrace everything that you are and understand that those of us who don't completely fit in are really the most interesting people. That's why I love actors. We don't, we don't quite fit into any one place. So we're always searching and expanding and, 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 and extending ourselves to take on different roles and different characters and, and, and put ourselves into emotional situations that sometimes can not only be challenging, but can be downright frightening, right? We're always trying to explore our world. So my dad, um, but in the industry itself, there's a guy who is like a, a, a dad for me. He, he passed away last year. Uh, I love him with all my heart. His name is Ernie Lively. Um, and I, he was actually the first acting class I ever took. And I got to tell you, I went into that class and I was horrible. <laughs> I, I, we, were, we were doing a scene from Backdraft. I'll never forget. And I was nervous and tense and I was calling the other character, my character's name. Like there were no names in the dialogue. I just, I, here's a John. John, you got it. No, that's you. So, oh, okay, crap. Um, and, and, and there was one moment, there was one moment where he got me really focused in and it was this intense moment. And I said something to him, uh, to the guy reading opposite me, and he said something back and I said something else. And Ernie just stopped there. He's like, that's it right there. Stop. <laughs> More because he was probably hurting and sad in his heart that this, this he's like, you need to stop. For everybody. <laughs> but he said, that's it right there. That mm. little moment. Mm. Did you feel that? And you know what? 
I, I, I took a moment and I stepped back and I did. For that moment, I was in that scene. I was engaged. What I said was the most important thing I had to say. And his response, I listened to. And then I responded back. He said, that's where it begins. Mm -hmm. And I kept coming back to class. And back then, um, like agents would pop into to classes kind of and, and, and check things out. And um, the agents who eventually picked me up, they said, well, okay, yeah, yeah, that was, you know, do you have any other skills or talents or whatnot? And uh, like, do you speak another language? I'm like, yeah, I'm fluent in Spanish. And so I think that was what got me in the door there. But Ernie um, kind of mentored me. He took me under his wing when I couldn't afford classes. He would just say, just show up, just keep coming. And um, from that, from those humblest beginnings, I kept coming and I kept coming and I, and I kind of found my footing and I landed in. And as my dad was uh, dying of Alzheimer's and was succumbing to that disease, Ernie stepped in and became a dad to me. And I actually started teaching eventually at his studio. So prior to teaching with John and, and Sean Sharma, our other partner, um, I taught with Ernie for years and it, it was so great. And he just, he really, he taught me how to be, he taught me how to be a man. He taught me how to be an actor, how to, how to take the, the lumps of, uh, of dealing with the passing of my father. The day, the first time my father forgot who I was, I, I called Ernie, you know, I'll never forget. I walked in the room and I said, Hey dad. And he said, hello. And I said, hello. I, you know, I, I thought I was messing around. But then he stuck out his hand and introduced himself to me. And he said, my name is Charles. And I, and then I realized, wow, this is a real thing. And I called Ernie and you know what Ernie did? He said, Hey, Charles, cause he had a studio at that time. Um, he said, come into the studio, come in and work. You don't wallow. We got to We got to keep moving forward. We got to keep you moving forward. And I went in and I was really happy that I did because I was, I was headed in a really dark place emotionally and I went in and I worked and, and Ernie being there for me, he just, he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot about being a father, about being a husband. And, and that's, that's moved me on. And, and then the last person who has inspired me, um, well, there are a couple more and I'll, I'll be really quick. My wife has been there for me every single step of the way. And what we talked about earlier about gatekeepers and about you, claiming kind of your strength, right? She had the story and I'm going to use a naughty word here because this is the word she used. So <laughs> preface, you can, you can bleep it out. It's the bad one. It's the top one. It's the, it's the, it's the F word, but I'm going to use it because it, it's important. So one day I came in, this is before we got engaged. We were, we, we, we had just been dating for a while. And I said, you know what? Damn it. I got to book something because I got bills to pay and, and stuff is mounting up. I got to book something soon. And she said to me, and, and this is my wife, awesome, brilliant, loving, amazing human being, Catholic school teacher, uh, uh, mother of two, just a great person. Right. She said, you know what, Charles, when we started dating, you never mentioned having to pay bills or doing stuff where money was involved in the industry. You just did this because you loved it. And she said, until you find the love for your acting again, you're not going to book a fucking thing. And she just stared me point blank in the wow. face and said that. I was like, wow. And John knows Chrissy. Like that's, that's not a word that rolls drippingly off the tongue for her, but she confronted me with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need that as, as artists, because we are dreamers and to focus that dream, you've got to have people in your life to say, hey, do this. Don't do that. Go here. You know, aim yourself with intention. Um, so there, and then yeah, honestly, the, um, my writing partner, Skeeter, is a big influence to me. Skeeter Jones, he's amazing. Uh, so motivated. So I've learned so much from a business aspect from him about being a professional, about the business of show. He is an incredibly talented, gifted human being, director, uh, uh, writer, cinematographer. He's, he's incredible. Um, and then John and Sean, man, I got to tell you, they motivate me every God, day. It took a while to get to me. I was like, how long do I have to <laughs> Well, you saved, you saved the best for last. I was like, last. where am I on the list? <laughs> you, saved, you saved the best for last. So, you know, look, 
It, you oh you want God. people to go to closing night. You don't go to in the middle. You, know? you don't go to shows in the middle. You, 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 end, you, end, you end with the bang. But you know what? Honestly, though, John has taken he's his focus and in getting us dialed in 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 the business and really understanding to to be successful you've got to have that that business mindset outside of the fact that john is a brilliant actor and and a brilliant teacher and all those wonderful things and husband and father and all those things that he is um his business acumen and his drive man that keeps me motivated so i surround myself with people who inspire me Mm -hmm. and that keeps me going forward you know you are the five closest people around you you know that's that's ultimately who you are who do you have in your circle? Who is it that that is is that uh, you know that that echo chamber for you? Who do you hear? Who do you bounce off of? Who are you, by whom are you motivated? You know, and so John definitely, man, one of the John and Sean, they they I wake up every day wanting to be better, to not only to build the school, obviously, but. Uh, just so that I don't let them down, right? So it's like okay, I'm I'm, I'm pulling my own way, uh, so. Well, you can you can tell from from that answer, Corbin, that that Charles is is very loved. That he's got a lot of people yes. there that that love him. And with what you're saying, Charles, I think that's that's great advice for anybody. And and what I what I like to say is, um, yeah, surround your people, surround yourself with people that love you, just mm-hmm. like you love them. Like you know, yeah. why hang around with people that like are going to put you down or going to you know poo poo things? You look at that cat. Uh, <laughs> for those that that aren't that aren't watching on YouTube, now she pops up because she knows oh, she's so yeah. ready though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. But, but surround yourself with people that, like you're saying, that are going to support you, that are going to be fans of yours, that are going to tell it to you straight when you need that. I think that's really, really important. And you have a say in that, you know, like I think about that. I remember, you know, there was a guy who like I had seen at some auditions. I was like, oh, he'd, he'd be a fun person to be friends with. And I reached out a couple of times and just like crickets, silence. I was like, OK, he's not interested. Mm-hmm. And then another one of my good buddies, uh, uh, Damien. We kept seeing each other at auditions. I reached out to him and then we, you know, we worked on projects together. We'd become buddies. And so you kind of have to like take some chances in my opinion, like that. For sure. Um, and, and, and you, then you find those people, uh, Charles and you, that was lovely what you said. And you had some, obviously some wonderful people that have influenced you. What do you think, Charles, with the teachers you've had, the mentors you've had, and now that you're a teacher, what are some like values or, you know, parts of being a teacher that are really um, important? Like what are, what are strengths that like, you know, either you have or that you see in teachers? Um, Gosh, that's a great question. You know, um, and again, this is something that uh, you and Sean both have. Um, And it's that you understand that it's, it's not a cult of personality. It's not my way. It's, Mm -hmm. I love teachers who understand that they only have a class because they have students who want to be there, right? It's not like, oh, this is the Charles Carpenter method. And there's no way that you're going to be able to ascend to the highest heights unless you do exactly what I say every time (laughs) I say it. No, I, you want to know who motivates me? My students, because every time I'm about to start class, I get that little nervous butterfly in my stomach. I get, I get, because, because I don't want to let them down because they're so talented. They're so gifted that I need to make sure I'm on my A game. And so I think that teachers who understand that they're a part of the collective whole, that it's, it's a give and take like, yeah, there's stuff that we want. There's a, there is a curriculum uh, that we have at storytellers and it's about, you know, assigning scenes and testing different ways to see if you're getting, you know, everything out of it. What can you do if it's, a, if it's jargon, if it's, you know, working co-star roles, if it's, if it's an emotionally heavy scene, if it's packed with dialogue, if there isn't dialogue, if there's movement, whatever it is. Right. But um, that you understand you're working with artists. I want to work with my peers. I want us all to be on a set together. So, so teachers who understand the importance of their students, I've had, I've gone to classes and I'm sure you guys have gone to, to classes similar to that, to where the teacher points out the, the two or three people who like book all the time, like, oh, okay, yeah, see them be, you know, may, maybe you can get to be like them. No, I don't want to be them. I want to be me. And I mm-hmm. want you to acknowledge that I'm not them. So mm-hmm. look at me. 
You know, I don't, I, I'm very happy that they're booking and I'm very happy that they're doing their stuff, but that doesn't mean that they're the only ones who know what to do. Like if, if you're worth your salt, reach everybody. So a teacher who can acknowledge how important the students are and what the students need and the ability to, I have a lot of improv in my background, the ability to, to shift gears, to think on your feet, to see what the class needs, to see what the individual uh, uh, students need, to see what your, your peers need and to be able to adapt and react to that. That's something really important um, for me. Uh, I also love teachers who are in the game. You know, I love working with, I love working with actors who like, yeah, not only am I teaching because I've got stuff to, and I was, I wasn't sure if jumping back in seven years ago now, starting to, to, to create this, you know, with Sean and John, I, I wasn't sure if um, I actually had anything to offer. It's like, well, I just kind of do the shit that I do. And yeah, I studied Meisner and different, you know, different methods and all that, but I, you know, I, I, and running camera as a, as a commercial and theatrical session director for 20 years. Um, I see the stuff that I see. So I, but I didn't think I had anything to give. And as I went on, I realized, wow, you know what? Yeah, I am a teacher. Just like, yeah, I am a working actor. I, I have, I have this to offer. So being able to work with people who are in the trenches along with you, I think that's, that's something that's really critical. Um, because you're there, because you can understand, you can speak the actor's language. You, you know that it's like when you lose in a veil. Yes, you, know? you felt it. And I think, Corbin, one of the things I was thinking about when I asked that question 25 minutes ago, uh, is, that Charles, <laughs> is that Charles, is that, <laughs> this is, yeah, we're, we're gonna wrap it up, you guys. No, we're, we're not, we're not. We're no, no, these are these are no, great. no, this is like, um, and, and this is this is coming. I've been listening to a lot of this other podcast called Smartless and Will Arnett and his bad sense of humor. And that's bad. I love it, actually. But uh, that's why I made that joke, Charles. So that was for fun because um, because I, I enjoy it. Yes or no um, questions. Move things <laughs> no, no, Charles. Charles, your answer was amazing. And here's what I was going to say is Charles cares. Yes, I think I think it's it, it. And I think that is a beautiful thing all, with all of that. Charles, that's that's what I've always felt from you is that you care. You care about your students. You care about the other people in your life. You care about your family. And I think that is a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing to have of, of having such a big heart and caring. And I've, I've felt that from, from, from day one with you. And I, I think the best teachers have that, you know, the best teachers, in my opinion, especially now, it's not the ones that are jerks the whole time or are just trying to squash you down and build you back up. No, it's like they yeah. care. They're invested in you. They're, they can, you know, give you the straight talk, but, but they help, help build you up. And the other thing is, you know, when you said that thing about what to offer, I think a lot of people can struggle with that. What do I have to offer? And you know, you know what my simple answer would be? You have excitement. Mm -hmm. You have your energy. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not good at it, when I get someone in class who's super excited, who's gun ho, even if they're not good, I love that. I love that energy. Or if I'm working on a project, you know, if they're excited, if they're, they're, they're hungry to learn, they're curious, they're, you know, reading the books, they're watching the movies, they're talking about like, to me, that's, that's that, that, that hunger or that excitement is something you always have to offer no matter what, no matter what the skill level is, you know, and I'm sure you had more to offer than that, Charles, obviously with all your experience, but I'm just saying for other people out there when they're like, well, you know, what do, what do I have to offer towards this, this field? Well, put your energy behind it. Everybody's got some energy in there to, to use. It's right? interesting. Yeah. It's put interesting. your energy behind it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, that, that it's that's brilliantly well said. Um, you you've got to. I I've gotten so much out of this industry. I feel really again. I feel really grateful. I I have a pension to me coming through SAG because I you know I got vested. I didn't even know what the what that meant until I got a letter saying, "Oh hey, you're vested." I had to look it up. I, like, I don't I don't know. I get a vest. Cool. Oh great. <laughs> Sweet. Wardrobe. I'll look great. You know, I, I I I've been able to provide for my family. I've met the most amazing, wonderful people. Um in my life in this industry, actors, writers, people uh, behind the camera, you know, who just creative, beautiful artists, you know, like my cup runneth over. It's great. And if, if I can get somebody else to realize they have the skill sets to have that sort of life to me, I'm not saying that this is easy, but when, when does, when did easy equate to good? Never. Right. Mm -hmm. Never. I don't mind working hard if I love what I'm doing mm -hmm. and if I can, if I can impart some of that to people and they can get out of it, even a fraction of what I've gotten out of it, 
you know, life is good. It's a good thing. Actually, actually you were, you're mentioning being in SAG. I was looking and I think it was in 1994 was the first time you got into SAG. Uh, yes. What have you seen that's been so different from then to now? Like, is it, how has that progression gone? Well, television, uh, television is now in color. So that's, right. <laughs> that's, 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 that's right. Well, <laughs> back, back when I was performing in the amphitheater. <laughs> smartless <laughs> smartless yeah. is not a good thing for Sean. Or John. I shouldn't <laughs> listen to it. Yeah. It's clearly too, too much. Uh, you know what? Here's something that I've noticed. Um, <laughs> I made mention earlier that I've got a lot of different races that make up who I am, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, when I first started running sessions in 2000, um, you would not have, and John can attest to this as a, as a session uh, director himself, you would not have people of mixed races auditioning together. You wouldn't. It would be broken down in category. You've got, if, if it's, uh, the role is for a couple, you got white people from 10 to noon. You've got black people from noon to, to two, and then you got lunch. And then from, you know, three to five, you've got Asian people. And then you've got uh, uh, Latino people, right? Like, and in between when you're switching categories, that would be when age, when, when the, the, the casting directors would be, and they would have to go to the agencies and say, look, we're shifting categories. People are coming in and we're just trying to get you because the, the agencies Point blank said, we don't want to see people of different races together. I'm not going to name names, but that was the pervasive, that was the prevailing attitude. And now you see uh you see gay couples, straight couples, mixed couples. It, it, so that has changed the 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 capacity to to see that we live in all sorts of different different shades. And so that's been something that's been really interesting because, you know, I, I say like, okay, I am, I am Latino and I am black, but because I look black, I can only audition in the black time slot, not the Latino time slot, which is insulting to me because yeah. I speak Spanish fluently. I'm proud of my heritage. So being able to see that acceptance, that's changed a lot. Um, Another who, thing who gives a shit, Charles, who gives a shit, who gives yeah. a shit who you love? I really, I think that's one of the best things now. Uh, it, 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 I feel like of who, you know, whoever you, you, you love or get paired up with it, 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 it really just in, in life or even with what you're talking about, where there was those strict lines. It's like, who, yeah. who you know, it's, it's, just, it's really like, if it's a beautiful story, if it's a great commercial, no one's going to care in my opinion, story, or dude. shouldn't care, you it's, know? Exactly. Tell the story. Um, another thing that has changed for everybody, is, as we are all aware, is it's rare that you're going to have a first call in person. You know, you will have one more often commercially because there are commercial casting directors who still have brick and mortars who are trying to say, hey, I to justify charging more for their sessions to keep their doors open. I get it. I understand it. But casting directors who have always been historically incredibly germaphobic <laughs> have now they realize I can get the same information from a self tape or if I want to work with the actor hands-on via zoom or ecocast or hey joe or blue jeans or whatever platform the the particular casting director wants to use so that is another uh that's a that's a big way that's a big paradigm shift in that you have to be able to emote to a computer right and amazingly enough if as a good actor, you can do it. You know, I liken it to working CGI or, you know, there's no, there's no Tyrannosaurus in front of you, but you've got to create it. You know, you've got to, you've got to be there. There's no alien super monster landing to attack you with lasers. You've got to create that. So theater of the mind is important. So that's another big shift. Just, you know, at, as a matter of fact, two days ago, I had an in-person audition that I drove to. And I remember thinking, and I was thinking to myself, gosh, this used to be my day. You know, if you have three auditions in a day, one in uh, one in the Valley, one in Hollywood and one in Santa Monica, that's your day. Man, it's just going, parking, finding, doing everything. Um, I think that COVID has really strangely has brought some of the humanity and respect back into casting. And, and here's, here's what I mean by that. There was one day I went into a casting studio and just like any casting studio, it, it happened to be, I was starting, I was doing basically a half day session, which means I came in like later on in the day and I was just going to kind of 
finish out the day. So other sessions had already been going. The, the lobby was full of people. And I walked in and I stopped and I looked around and the, it was jammed to the rafters and everybody was talking and uh, it, it was a big exposed brick walls. And so the sound reverberated and it, and it grew and it was just, just this cacophony of sound. And in the corner over there, there were a bunch of octogenarians sitting, waiting for their turn. And in the corner over there, there was a mother with her newborn and then, and everything in between, right? And nobody cared. Nobody cared. Nobody cared that the, that the, the elderly people coming into audition were just sitting out there exposed, sitting in, with all this noise and had to move slowly or came in with walkers or stuff. People were just herded in and out. Nobody cared that the mom had her babies because, because the mindset was, well, if you don't want to be here, don't be here. We lost our humanity, in my opinion, over the years. And what COVID forced us to realize is that these are humans. These are people. You don't want to be in a room with them because you don't want to get sick, but these are humans and you have to take care of them. So now castings are different. You walk in, it's not a, it's not, there's not a, a horde of people in the room waiting for you in a, in a, in a, in a an in-person audition. And that's, that's brought unintentionally the humanity back. You have to care now for these times. You have to care now for these people. Um, and you always should have, but it, it became such a meat market feel. And I really, I walked in to work my session and, you know, as running sessions, John, as you know, you go into the room, you close the door, people come back in, unless you're working the door yourself. And I was just kind of distanced from it, but I felt kind of gross, you know, because as an actor myself, I'd be in the room, I'd be sitting out there in the lobby waiting to do it, but nobody respected them. Nobody cared. And, and yeah, well, we need to see people, our clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? These are humans. These are humans. We gotta, we've got to respect each other more. And I think that hopefully having been forced to take the time to pull back and see what's really important in life, health and the people that you love, that has begun to spill over. Um, because, you know, now if I get three auditions, I can lay down three auditions here in my studio at home <clears throat> within a couple hours based on what the what the rigors or the demands of each particular audition are. So you're getting more cracks up at bat. Um, yeah. That's something else. Whether the casting directors watch your work is it's really dependent upon your skill level and your ability to this is something that I work on in class. How do you grab us? How do you pop instantly? What is it? If everybody else, if the scene opens the same way with you sitting in a chair, like it's an interrogation scene, change it up a little bit, come in, walk in and land, do something, give them something to like, Oh, all right. That's interesting. How do you, how do you get the ball rolling? Right. Um, so those are, those are things that I've, I've seen uh, that are just kind of basic changes um, that we're dealing with, but zoom working like this, this isn't going away. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're right. And I, when you mentioned the humanity of things, I think there's something about, you know, jobs or things where you see a lot of people and they're somewhat, <clears throat> even though we know a lot of people like anonymous, like if you think about when you go to like the DMV and they see a lot of people and people are like, they kind of, mm -hmm. you, you kind of lose the humanity. And, and what I was thinking about was, I remember I was in Wisconsin and I had my, my grandpa had a farm. So I had this old Ruby farms truck that I just loved. It was like gold. It said Ruby farms on the side. And I was like, nice. so I, I just loved it. Yeah. Um, and I remember coming, I was, I pulled up behind a car at a stoplight and the car in front of me, the light turned green and I was kind of waiting. And now I really hate when people aggressively honk when they're like, ah, like angry honking. I don't like a yeah. honk. That's like, Hey, I'm here is more of my, my style. So I was waiting, waiting. The car wasn't going. So I like gave it, you know, just like a honk of like, Hey, you know, you got to go. Cause I was a bit in a hurry. I swear to God, the next stoplight I was in front and my truck died oh, an old truck. No. and then the car behind me is like laying on the horn you know what i mean <laughs> and i was like i can't get it to start it's an old ass truck you know like and, and it was literally the exact like just the next stop light over but it, it 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 for some reason something clicked in my brain of like you know and i and know people have heard it but like i had you don't know exactly what's going on in that car in front of you you know and right. like i said i didn't do like an angry honk i did but but the guy behind me did and i think there's something where you know when you're in places where you're seeing a lot of people, 
you know, whether it's road rage or not, when you're in a smaller town, if someone does road rage, you're like, Oh, that's Charlie. I know Charlie, you know what I mean? I know his parents. It's like harder to do. I I think Mm -hmm. versus where you're anonymous and someone drives by and, you know, and so, Mm -hmm. you know, I I love what you said there, Charles, of, of refining the humanity, because I feel like our field, a lot of people have been taken advantage of and can be taken advantage of because so many people are are trying to get into it that you can forget that. You know, and, and I think that's one of the reasons, you know, you and I have always gotten along and, you know, we we have very aligned goals of treating people like people. It doesn't matter, you know, who you are, what you're doing. It's like, I want to treat you like a person, you know? Oh, for sure. I, anytime I would come into your sessions, I knew that I was going to get the same love and focus and energy at five in the afternoon that you gave to the guy at 10 in the morning when the session started, you know? Yeah. And there's something to be said for that integrity. That's, that's one of the things that I really wanted to, to make people feel is that when you walk into my session, you're comfortable. You're yeah. I acknowledge you as an artist. Okay. Now let's, let's create art. Let's, let's make this work. Um, and yeah, it's, it's so important. I did a really kind of random, you know, very informal kind of surveys, you know, when you're running sessions uh, so often, and I would ask people throughout the course of my 20 years, just someday. So, Hey, you know, how are you doing? How are you feeling? You know, where are you studying? Um, number one, a lot of people don't study. And I think that that's a, that's a mistake. And I'm not saying that that's a plug for us, but I'm saying if, if you want to be a musician and you don't pick up your instrument every day and play it, how are you going to be a musician? Right. If you want to be an actor, how are you going to be an actor? Unless you, pick up your instrument, you yourself and, and play it, you know, every yeah. day. Um, yeah. Charles, just, just with that, while we're in this world, I was just thinking, um, cause that's great. Any other advice that you've learned about like acting from working in casting? Yeah. Be subtle, be subtle. If you're in theater and theater is awesome and I love theater and it's amazing and it's important and it teaches you so many skills, but in theater, you have to speak to the back of the room, right? Which is way over there. For television, the back of the room is about a foot in front of your face, right? The the camera's going to get in. If you're in in an extreme close-up, you're as tight as you can be. Your face fills the frame. Be subtle. Work on your subtlety. Work on feeling the emotion, holding it. If you feel it, we'll see it. We're a very savvy audience, okay? So it's not about trying to get, I need Corbin to see that I'm mad. No, no be mad. Corbin will feel it, you know, and, and it, the subtlety is key to be able to emote, to be able to tell a story. And that's one of the biggest things in, in casting that you hear all the time. Be subtle, be small, you guys be small, be small with it. You don't have to, you know. Yeah. I always call it like after the office, once the office came out, everything was like, like post the show, the office, everything was subtle and small. It was like, yeah. you know, cause that was, the, that was, the, and I, I, I love that Charles, the thing I'd, I'd add for people out there that are, that are artists is like my, my, my thing is always fulfill the role. And if there's an opportunity, bring yourself to it. Mm-hmm. So those two things, you got to fulfill the role. You got to be whatever that role is. And then if there's an opportunity, bring some of yourself into it. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and I think it, that's one thing that you see of, if you see someone like in an audition and they feel like, okay, that feels very like, let's say generic. I don't get any of, you know, flavor of them or what they would be like, right. what they would do with it, you know, right. or, oh, they're just being themselves. I don't see them in this role, you know? So I think, you know, trying to combine those two things, I think is kind of the balance that I, that I encourage actors to, to, to seek when I'm running castings. You know? I, I, I always tell people, you've got three selves. You've got your public self, which everybody sees. Uh, hey, I'm Charles Carpenter. How are you? Nice to meet you. You've got your personal self where you let your friends in to see a little bit more about you. Oh, hey, you know, I, I, I love rainy days and, and I cry at sad movies, right? Like you get, to, you get to know the person a little more. But then you have your private self and your private self is where you are your truest. And sometimes you don't let anybody in to see that portion of yourself. And in your private self, you are the most altruistic, the most kind, the most loving, but you're also the most sexist, racist, misogynistic. We all have those components in us. We do. The only thing that separates us from people who may not be as kind or as moral uh, is the fact that we will stamp those 
more negative aspects of us down, but we all have them. We all feel them. So how do you find the truth in your private self and connect it to the truth of the private self of the character you're playing? Because remember, that character has a private self too, right? So it's not about Corbin or John or Charles disappearing and this other character coming through. No, we are the vessel. It What makes it interesting is you finding your personal truth and connecting that to the character. What is it that you can connect with? That's what makes your, your roles interesting and, and vital and unique because you're bringing yourself to it. Like for instance, I've never murdered anybody, but if I have to play a murderer, I have to understand Am I motivated by hate? Because yeah, I've been mad enough to where I've been in fights to where I've wanted to hurt somebody. I've just not taken it to that extreme. I have that moral filter. I won't go there, but I can allow myself to journey through that. I've been so mad at somebody. This character killed somebody. Okay, I can I can find my truth in that. Or is he motivated by jealousy? Did jealousy lead to the murder or was he motivated by fear? He thought they were going to expose him or something. So you see what I mean? It's find that private truth in yourself yeah. and find a way to attach it to your character and explore that. Charles, let me, let me ask you um, um, if like Corbin's private self is a lot of pornography. Should he bring that to, should he bring that to every role or Good. just love uh, porn? Love uh, uh, if, if that's, listen, then if that's in your wheelhouse, if that's your skill set, <laughs> watch it. I was going to, I was going to say, I actually was weirdly enough thinking about kind of what you're talking about, Charles, where I was, I like was just like went to the restroom and then I looked in the mirror and I was just like making faces <laughs> and I was just being weird. And I, I just realized like, I don't ever let people see that. And it's kind of what you're talking about. That's more of a comedic kind of thing rather than like murder, like you're saying, but like, it's finding those opportunities to be in a, in a solitary place and not judging yourself and kind of letting that go. And I, I like that a lot. For yeah, sure. Yeah. You know that, that, and then Corbin has a great point that judging of yourself shuts down a lot of your genius. Yes. Yep. It really does. It cuts it like cuts out the roots, you know? Um, and, and, and so you're, you're totally right. Uh, Corbin, I think when they, you know, when they talk about actors or artists or things that are, that are fearless, they, you know, they are allow themselves to kind of be weird, to be different, you know, to do those things um, that, that I think is like, is really important. And I, and I love that Charles. I, I hadn't heard that before. I, I love that idea um, of connecting the private selves. I think that's great. Yeah. You, you great. get to, because that's where you get to explore. You know, the reason why John is, is a brilliant actor is because John brings a piece of John to this character. Mm -hmm. How, how are we going to explore, explore this other person's truth if we completely divest ourselves of the experience, right? Mm -hmm. find, find where you exist in that character. I use murder, for example, because that's something that I hope nobody wants to do, right? And so, but we're going to be forced to do that, you know, but even in comedy, how can you find your inner weirdo, mm -hmm. you know, and, and attach that to that other character? That's where you, that's where you find, the truth. And that's where you have those epiphanies where like, oh, yeah, I, I get where this guy's coming from now. Let me keep exploring him. He, he just does stuff in a different way than I would. But that's where you find it. We have such an amazing gift, you guys. It's like it's our X-Man power mm -hmm. to be able to change people's emotional states. You know, and it's happened to us. Anyone who has been affected by a movie or a show or a play, you go in a certain way and you leave feeling a completely different way. That's our gift. You guys, that's the magic of what we do. We can take somebody who is having a, a bad day, a difficult situation. Maybe they're feeling, maybe they're in a, in a really dark place. And through what we do, we help them through that. We give them some understanding. We let them see wow, other people are feeling what I'm feeling. We make them smile. We make them laugh. We make them feel something else. That's our gift. That's our magic. With this, like, how much do you think, like, animal work and stuff kind of falls into that kind of being able to put yourself out there in a different... Because I, to me, that kind of stuff unlocks. I was, when you were talking about everything, it's, it reminded me of... Um, uh, Hannibal Lecter and like ha how he was like looking and trying to be like a I think a lizard was it or like just that kind of stuff being able to open up to this murderous thing because it's all instinctual at that point and I just like like you said be, 
instincts, I think, is what comes through and makes people feel because we all have that in the back of our head. And I'm, I'm wondering how, how your prep kind of goes into that. I think it's hugely, it's hugely important to allow yourself to do things that make you feel uncomfortable. Because- give, yourself, give yourself permission. Is yeah. that what I thought about? Yeah. A lot of times you, you know, an animal work, I love that Corbin, that example. It's like people like, I don't know what to do. And then you're like, well, let's, you know, pretend you're a monkey. It gives them permission to mm-hmm. be like, oh, I, I can do that. I can mimic that. I can imitate that. And, and, mm-hmm. and so Charles, I, I want to hear what you have to say, but I just, I had to jump in because that idea of permission, give yourself permission. I think that is like, sometimes we need from outside, but like to give it internally too, is such a great thing to help us out. One of the things that I always say in class and that I always said when I was running sessions and that I I just, I really espouse is that this is a safe space. And I let everybody know, you can be politically incorrect here. Why? Because if your character calls for that, you've got to be that. You have permission to be a raw human animal here, Mm -hmm. you know, and so explore Explore going to places that might make you feel weird, feel uncomfortable, because guess what? In that uncomfortability, you're going to discover ways to deal with that. You're going to discover ways through it. You're going to eventually just say, all right, you know what? F it. (laughs) 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 And you get to be weird. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. We get to be weird and enjoy it. And don't ever approach a scene like, okay, class is good because I did this scene right. No, there's no right or wrong. It's your art. There are stronger choices. There are choices that are more in alignment with the writing, right? To honor the writing, to honor the character, uh, to honor the, the mood of the piece, the genre, all that. Yeah, of course. But give yourself permission, as, as John said, which is to, to make strong choices and to know that you get to try things. I'm going to try something completely out of left field. You know what? I'm going to play I'm going to, I'm going to play this, this interrogation scene as if I'm completely stoned. Is that the way I would do it for the audition? No, but let's see what happens. Let's see if I put myself in a loopy state of mind, what that does for me. You know, it's like, again, you've got those awesome guitars in the background there, Corbin. It's like grabbing one and playing and and riffing and just trying stuff. You're not laying it down to be perfect. You're just playing. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the exploration. Yeah. Yes. The exploration is, is yeah. When we allow acting to become part of our social fabric, then we really are actors. <clears throat> you know, when you, when you allow yourself to, I need to chill out. So I'm going to, I'm going to smoke a joint or I'm going to have a drink. Okay, fine. But, or uh, I'm going to take a bath. All right. That's how you decompress. Right. But challenge yourself to, I need to, I need to relax. I'm just going to grab a set of sides and be another human for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. When our acting becomes what we do and how we view the world, we really open ourselves up to amazing possibilities. And that's one of those things you talk about the, you talk about the animal work, you know, for uh, Hugh Jackman's role as Wolverine, he didn't know what a Wolverine was. So he studied wolves, like his, his scowl and his look that that's what he did. And then eventually he, he found out, Oh, wow, there's an actual animal called a Wolverine. This is what, this is what it is. But he let himself get feral. He let himself mm. get into that place. Um, we got to We've got to dare ourselves to do uncomfortable things just because eventually that becomes fun. You know, it's, I always say this, Nervous is just excited that doesn't believe in itself yet. Mm-hmm. And so if you, if you get, if you haven't trained, you know, this leads back to, to everybody work, you should work, you should have a rehearsal network around you. But if you don't train or pick up copy or work text every day, <clears throat> when you get an audition that is seven pages long, your first thought is, oh crap, seven pages, <laughs> as opposed to it being Oh crap, seven pages. All right. Yeah. You know, it's it's just allowing yourself to be excited and and invigorated by the prospect of getting to play. And you only get there by doing it a lot. I really yeah. I really like that. Cause that's how I feel. Every time I get a script, there's always that moment before where I'm like, oh God, there's like even if it's one line, it's just like it takes me an hour to get into it. But as soon as I get into it, I'm having the time of my life. And I think it's mm-hmm. exactly as you're talking about. It's like I don't believe in myself in that first moment but instead if you just from like the inception of it just kind of jump in and be excited that's i love that so much 
Yeah. That's, you don't, one of the, that's one of the steps for procrastination they talk about is just saying, I'm going to work on this for five minutes. And once you get over that first hurdle, Corbin, that you're talking about, mm -hmm. then you do it for an hour. And I think it's really true, whether it's writing, whether it's working on things where you're like, oh God, seven pages. I don't know any of it. You just got it. You just got it. There's no way you, you can just know got it. it. You yeah. know what I mean? How and then you, you work on it. Yeah. For, you know, but, but getting over that first hurdle, of course, I think, yeah, it can, be, can feel intimidating. Yeah. And it's, and it's the routine, right? You guys know you get those seven pages. If you're in the routine of script analysis, of breaking down copy, of looking at a scene and understanding it, it's easy. You, you truncate the amount of time it takes for you to understand the scene because you're doing it. You're in the habit. That is your routine. If you're not, then you're looking at those seven pages and it really can be a daunting prospect because like, oh my gosh, now I actually have to be an actor. No, it's John said something once that, that it really rang true with me. He said, it isn't, if I've got an audition due on Monday, it isn't the next 48 hours that's going to determine my success. It's the last six months. You know, have I been working? Have I been studying? Have I put those pieces of the puzzle in place together so that my next 48 hours now is the discovery? It's putting to use everything that I've learned. Yeah, it's 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 too late. It's not, you know, um, LeBron James shooting in pregame warmups is not making his jump shot for the game that night. That's just right. warming up his instrument. You know what I mean? It's what he's done over the summer. It's all those other things. And I think it's a very similar thing um, with acting, Charles. And and I think you're you're totally right. And you got you got to figure out how to have that discipline. Mm -hmm. You got to figure it out, and that can come from internal. If that's not working, external, like a class or with other people. Yeah. It can come from work, but if you don't somehow figure out that discipline, it's just, it's, it's, it's too challenging. It's too competitive. You know, it, it, it's so rare that anyone can do it without putting in that time. You just got to put in those reps in that time. Yeah. For me, it's about consistency. Do it a lot. Get in, get the reps in, get the reps in, because then it becomes part of what you do. People who want to get in shape, it's a, it's a bitch to start training and getting up and feeling mm -hmm. sore and you find excuses not to do it. Mm -hmm. As a martial artist, I've trained martial arts for 20 years. When we start off, you, you, don't, you don't throw a white belt in with a bunch of black belts and just expect them to, to cover up and just take it. No, you build them along slowly, but you got to get that routine in. Just show up, just show mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. just show up. And, you know, that's the key. And it's, it's also about, mindset. And I, I believe words have power to them. And I'll give you a quick story or quick for me. Um, my son, I was, I was driving with him the other day and uh, he's 14 and just an awesome kid, Logan. Hi, Logan. Uh, love him so much. And we're, we're driving along. And he, uh, he said, Hey dad, why is it that sometimes good people are born in bad places? And, and I sat with that. And you know, because we were talking about, you know, war and famine and disease and just, you know, stuff that happens all the time, kids going to bed hungry, kids going to bed afraid. And he asked me that and I didn't have, that's above my pay grade. I didn't have an answer. I said, I don't know. I don't, there's no, there's no one answer and it's not fair. For those kids, they, their life is made up of have to. I have to find shelter. I have to find food. I have to find safety. I have to hide. I have to do these things. For us as actors, and this is an epiphany that I had just recently that um, has, it's been, it's shifted the paradigm of how I look at things and it really has been a game changer for me. I replace the word have with the word get. I get to be a teacher. I get to work on seven pages of sides. I get to push myself. I get to be a father. People complain about, ah, I have to go to work. No, you get to go to work. You get to make money. You get to provide for your family. I have to pay the mortgage. No, you get to pay the mortgage. That means that you have a roof over your head. I, I, I have to pay the DWP bill. No, you get to pay the DWP bill. That means you have water clean water or relatively clean in LA, you, you get these things, right? You get to do that. So when you get seven pages of sides, don't tell yourself, ah, man, I have to, ah, it looks like I, I have to stay up late tonight. I have to work on this. 
No, I get to work on this. I get to experience this character. I get to push myself. That understanding that this is a, this is a, this is a right. This is a gift that you have. It makes it easier for you to want to go to class for you to want to push, you know, nobody says, Hey, what are you doing tomorrow, John? I have to go to the beach. No, you never say that. He's like, (laughs) I'm going to the beach. I get to go to the beach. We get to be actors. We get to be artists. We, We get to do this. So let's, let's love it. Let's make ourselves better. Let's, let's raise the level of discourse in this industry by getting to be amazing. So I, I, that, that's something that, that, I has really it. helped me to, to focus. Corbin, in. you can you can see why I wanted Charles on. Don't you just yeah. feel ready to just I'm, rip I'm, off the headphones and go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just want to just like get up and scream. It's just, so great. Just, <laughs> exactly. Do it absolutely. Be weird. Yeah, Charles. Charles, I want to ask you. Um, outside of outside of acting, how do you how do you recharge your uh, recharge your battery? Um, you know what? Uh, I really am a, a dorky home, homebody. I I love being with my family. If there's snow on the ground, I love to go skiing. Um. I'm a martial artist, so that gives me a lot of escape um, just to be able to go into, you know, hitting the heavy bag, going through my forms, doing groundwork that uh, I'm very kind of attached to my, my body as an instrument. So being able to that, that, that martial arts escape allows me to kind of focus and ground myself and, and regroup, you know, like John, I know for you, you're, a, you're an amazing basketball player. So getting out and there's a purity in dribbling in moving and getting the rhythm of the shot and getting in that repetition. in. um, I also, uh, shameless plug. I, I, uh, have written a series of novels. So I love to dive into my writing and play, um, shield Where of destiny, shield, shield of destiny.com destiny. for all of your fantasy needs. Um, but, uh, I, writing those novels, working on them with my, my co-author Skeeter Jones, uh, um, being able to disappear into another world that completely removes me from this. It allows me to, it allows me to divest any, any energy into stress that I may put into this and just kind of clear myself out. So everything is always the kind of storytelling related, how I kind of you know, recoil. I'm either telling a story physically or, or emotionally if it's written or if it's spoken. Um, so that's uh, watching the world through my kids' eyes. You know, my daughter is at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and being able to see how she looks at the world. Two days ago, negative 17. I said, all right, you said you wanted winter. Watch it. <laughs> she got, got it. winter. She you got know? winter. And, uh, <sighs> and my son watching him, he's, he loves, you know, he, He's a great student. They're both great students. He uh, he just got his second D1 scholarship offer. Uh, Colorado State offered him a scholarship. And that makes me happy seeing the world through their eyes. It, And I think that that's what we as actors do, right? We want to see the world through other people's eyes. And we get the opportunity to tell their stories. So that's how I reset. But I'm never too far away from it, you know, because... I love, I love what I do. I, I get, love it. I get to be an actor. I get to be a teacher. So one, one final question before we get to best bad acting, there is a Charles Carpenter fan page on Facebook. And my question is, is there too much sexy on it? Charles? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I didn't even know there was a Charles Carpenter fan page. You didn't even it. know. You're up there, buddy. Um, looking great right um, there. <laughs> I, uh, Make an appearance. People be happy. Wow. You know what? Um, yeah, there's always sexy babies. I can't turn it off. Uh, this, is, this is my, yeah, that's what I was that's my Latin about. heat, man. I can't. I cannot turn it off the sexy. Babies. That's the new the name of our podcast, Latin Heat. Latin, Latin heat. heat. I love it. Okay, well, that was awesome. That was just what I was looking for, Latin Heat. Uh, Charles, we get to our our final segment of this, which is um, what Corbin and I call your, your best, best bad, bad acting. acting. <laughs> so we're gonna put a a movie quote that 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 you're gonna recognize in the chat here. If you take a look. Um, okay. from a famous movie called The Princess Bride. And um, what you get to do, Charles, is you can have fun with it. Have fun being over the top. So if you want to give it an accent, if you don't, if you want to do it serious or you know, comedic, however you want, it's more to have fun than anything else. So whenever, uh, do you like it? Is it a good one? Do you like it, Charles? Great. Are you kidding me? This is awesome. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. You're a thank ya, Gastron. That's what's so funny. I switched classes when your back was turned. <laughs> you fool. You fall victim to one of the classic blunders, the most famous of which 
is never get involved in the land war in Asia, but only slot the less well known is this. Never go in against a Scotsman when death is on the line. <laughs> Yeah, I am so happy. Oh, that was amazing. Wow. That was amazing. I thought we were going to have a Sicilian Scotsman, but I like that he I, just rolled with it and changed it. I love it, Charles. Oh, I love gotta it. Gotta play a little bit. Gotta play a little bit. Oh, this is awesome. I love that. Uh, and what a great quote. <laughs> That's so good. Okay. Um, and so we want to, Corbin, do you have a redirect? <laughs> it's a, I have one, but I don't think it's going to top it. I want to see you do stone charles as you were mentioning with like that guy oh, who kind of relaxes in the bathtub Dome with us with okay. A joint. okay 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 <laughs> you only think you guessed wrong <laughs> no <laughs> that's what's so funny no 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 i switch glasses when your back was hurt <laughs> You fool. Oh, you fell victim. What? <laughs> no, you, you fell victim to one of the classic blunders, okay? The, the most famous of which is never get involved in a land war in Asia. Duh. But only slightly less, less well known. <laughs> Never go in against a Sicilian. <laughs> <laughs> when death is on the line. I have so many favorite parts in that. That was so good. Okay, I got one more because it came up earlier. Okay. okay. Charles, I want to hear this as Hannibal Lecter. Ooh. You only think you guessed wrong. Wow. That's what's so funny. <laughs> I switched glasses when your back was turned. <laughs> you fell victim to one of the classic blunders, the most famous of which is never get involved in a land war in Asia, but only slightly less when known as this. Never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line. Charles, oh my God. <laughs> that was my favorite. So good. Charles, if we could figure out how to get a clip out of this and put it on Instagram, we would take that clip. We don't know. We don't have the technology, but that was. <laughs> we, we, we don't so have the technology. Good. Corbin, wasn't that amazing? I, every single one was so 10 out of 10. Oh, I 10 can't believe it. Ah, uh, we get to be uh, silly. Uh, we get to be silly. Thank you for indulging my weirdness. No, that was amazing. Oh my gosh. Thank you for so showing great. us. Oh my gosh, that was I was cra I was loving it. I was, and you, we gave you a long one because I said let's challenge yeah. Charles. He's good. He can have. <laughs> this is the longest quote we've had, Charles, of Love any it. of the episodes. Yeah, <laughs> and you, you, you raised the bar. You crushed the bar. Uh, you benched the bar. You squatted the bar. <laughs> um, Charles, I just got to say, man, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so glad that you did this. Like, I, I am so happy to call you a friend. And, you know, that and, and a, and a co-owner and partner and just, you know, the fact that, like I said, at the, at the very beginning, you know, you're you're a, a lovely, lovely person with a lot of love in your heart that you that you give generously uh, and people feel that, you know, they feel that immediately. And so I just I'm, I'm so happy that uh, that we got to hang out and uh, that people got to get to get a chance to get to know you better. Uh, thank you so much. I feel the same way, John. You are an amazing soul, an amazing human being, brilliant actor, teacher, and and friend. And I am. Uh, my life is richer for having you in it. And Corbin, so awesome to hang out with you, brother. I, I look forward to many more collaborations in the future. That's, that's, that's so great to get to know you more. It's I'm so happy. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, Charles, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for stopping by the Moving Spotlight, the number one content creator <laughs> actor writer podcast what's our tagline um how Not to take that. control of your creative career <laughs> thank you so much for stopping by charles we're trying to lighten it up a little bit in here every once in a while because we got we went deep today we went deep so. i love it it's um, good it's but, good thank you guys charles it was lovely having you you're the best and i'll uh, i'll be talking to you soon all right be well you guys bye all right, bud. bye hey john did you know we have a website? Mm -hmm. This is new. <laughs> it's crazy, right? It just kind of appeared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have what? Uh, we have merch on there that people can buy if you want a mug.
with our Whoa. logo on it. It's kind of Merch, fun. Mm -hmm. Merch short for merchandise. <laughs> merchandise. I love it. And then yes. we also have our recommendations on there too for like TV shows, movies, and books and stuff. So uh, check it out. That's going to be an ever growing list. I know it's fun. Is, is every image of the Moving Spotlight podcast or do we recommend other stuff besides <laughs> ourselves? It's always us. That's the only thing. That's the, the people have to like us and that's the only way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's awesome. Well, I would uh, uh, recommend people check out the website. That'd be great. They can find out more information. Wonderful. They can also uh, check us out on their podcast app of choice, mm -hmm. Corbin. That's available. And we're uh, we're on YouTube too. So if you're beautiful. if you're wanting to see our beautiful faces as we're talking at you, please oh please gosh. watch us there and give us a like, you, give us a subscribe. You, you got to look at Charles Carpenter. If you Ooh, don't look yes. at Charles Carpenter, like that's just a handsome devil of a, of a guy handsome, right there. So such a charismatic guy. You just got to watch him. You got, he's you the best. Check it out. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you for listening to the. Moving Spotlight Podcast.